Grammar Day. It's me, your instructor, Joel. Maybe you've written a paper before and been told that you use dangling modifiers. But what's a dangling modifier, you probably asked. Good thing for you that Grammar Day is here. Modifiers are the parts of your sentence that describe or modify other parts. For example, in this sentence, scary obviously modifies squirrel. It's telling us what the squirrel is like. You can see this modifier attachment in the sentence diagram. Squirrel is the very important word, and scary depends on that word. Thanks to Edgar for this horrifying image. Dangling and misplaced modifiers happen when the parts of your sentence don't connect like you think they do. This is also called attachment ambiguity, because it's no longer obvious what is modifying what. Let's look back at the basics of sentence structure. Here's a perfectly normal sentence. Squirrels eat students. Can you find the subject, verb, and object? Very good. Eat is the verb because it's what's happening. Squirrels is the subject because they're doing the eating. And students is the object because students is what's getting et, eaten. Here's a more complicated sentence. Can you find the subject, verb, and object? Yep, I knew you could do it. Now, I might want to make this sentence more descriptive. But do you see the problem here? The phrase, although perfectly seasoned, comes right before the subject, I, which makes it seem like I might be the one who's perfectly seasoned. This phrase, although perfectly seasoned, is a dangling modifier because it's grammatically unclear what the phrase describes. I could fix this ambiguity by adding a preposition. It can't refer to me, because I'm a person, for reals. So this clears up the problem. Here's an example of a type of sentence I often see in English 101 papers. What's the source of ambiguity here? Although you can probably guess that the phrase, by practicing every day, is aimed at some person, maybe the speaker, maybe the listener, or maybe someone else, there's nothing in the sentence for this phrase to attach to. It's another dangling modifier. Grammatically, the obvious choice is the pronoun it, but that doesn't make any sense. What is it, and why is it practicing juggling chainsaws? Instead, you could make the subject explicit and say, by practicing every day, you will get better at juggling chainsaws, or make practicing into the subject, Practicing every day will make it easier to juggle chainsaws. There are lots of ways to make this sentence clearer. While we're on the subject of pronouns, unclear pronoun reference is another common source of ambiguity. Look at these two sentences. I put all my gray nutrition cubes into separate lunch boxes, but they were destroyed by entropy. I always try to buy fresh nutrition cubes every week in an attempt to avoid the scorn of my peers, but this is getting more difficult all the time. In the first sentence, what is they referring to? It could be the nutrition cubes, or it could be the lunch boxes. There's no way to tell for sure. The pronoun's antecedent, the word it points back to, is not clear. In the second sentence, what is the antecedent of this? It could be trying to buy fresh cubes, or it could be avoiding the scorn of my peers. Even if you have a pretty good guess, the sentence is still ambiguous. Dangling modifiers have unclear reference, but misplaced modifiers pretty clearly modify the wrong thing. Here's an example from a newspaper article. An ethnically diverse crowd of about 50 gathered at the Falkirk Mansion in San Rafael yesterday for a speak out against hate crimes organized by the Marin County Human Rights Roundtable. Do you see the problem? It sounds like the Human Rights Roundtable is organizing hate crimes. Oh, snap! Let's look at the next sentence. The new hunting season opens today with more hunters and more bears allowed to be killed. This implies that there is a quota for hunting hunters. At least the bears get a fair chance, I guess. Jokes are sometimes based on attachment ambiguity, and as we know, jokes are always more funny when you analyze them to death.
Groucho Marx was famous for this sort of thing. He said, One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas I'll never know. Think about that for a second. Another one is from the movie Mary Poppins. I know a man with a wooden leg named Smith. And the reply, what was the name of his other leg? So that's an example of what people used to think was funny. Ambiguous phrasing is also really common in newspaper headlines, where editors take out all the helpful grammatical words that provide connections. There's a linguistics blog called Language Log, what, linguistics is cool, that noticed how terrible newspaper headlines can be. They wrote about this headline from the New York Times. Violinist linked to J.A.L. Crash Blossoms. What's a crash blossom, they wondered. It turned out that it was about a violinist whose father had died in a Japan Airlines crash and whose career had lately been very successful or blossoming. But there's no way to tell that from just the headline. Ambiguity. <coughs> Language Log decided to name this kind of confusion Crash Blossoms after the headline that started it all. Here's another crash blossom the language log found, something a little closer to home and a bit more disturbing. I'll let you read it and figure out the ambiguity yourself. Needless to say, this would be a problem in any courtroom. And here's one more case of ambiguity that you might recognize. It's on Aurora, driving south under downtown. I guarantee you, if I see this tunnel flashing in and out of existence, I will not go in. Of course, we know what this means, but it's still ambiguous and funny. The last thing I want to say about attachment ambiguity is that even though it can lead to funny or embarrassing results, everyone gets confused about it sometimes, even the experts. This article from Language Log talks about one grammar expert, Richard Laterer, who criticizes people for using dangling participles. That's a specific kind of dangling modifier, which I won't describe here. He gets a bit mean about making fun of people for misusing the language, but it turns out that all through his article he's misusing the term dangling participle. So don't feel bad if you dangle a modifier here and there. I'll point them out when I see them, but it's never personal. Well, that's the end of Grammar Day for this week. I hope you had as much fun as I did. On Canvas, you'll find a grammar activity to help you practice what we talked about. I'll see you over there.